Well, hey there, College Hill. Good evening, and uh, it's really nice to have a chance to speak with you. Um, Stephen had reached out to me in an email and, and asked if I'd be willing to speak for a Wednesday night service. Um, and now that you know, we're in this, this kind of strange season of, of COVID, and uh, while as that uh, confusing and strange and odd at times as that may be, uh, one of the things he mentioned in his email is that you know the the um, time zones and, and geographic distances become a little bit less meaningful right now, and so. Um, there's certainly a silver lining to that, and I'm uh, really honored to get to spend a little bit of time speaking with you uh, this evening. And uh, it's nice to feel connected with everybody. Um, we are a long way off, but we do love you guys, and it's um, really encouraging to have your support and to have your love and to have your prayers behind us. Um, so, Stephen says the, the series we've been doing in the last few weeks has been in Philippians, and so today we are in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Um, so let's take a, a moment to look at that together. Philippians 3, 1 through 10. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. Before I go any further, I want to take a moment to just stop and think about what Paul is talking about here. To think about what Paul means whenever he talks about these evil workers, these dogs, these people who mutilate the flesh. Uh, everything in that description is very harsh. <laughs> Even our ears removed from the original context by some 2,000 odd years later. I mean, if somebody calls you a dog... You know they're not exactly paying you a compliment. But for the contemporary readers of Paul's letter, I, I think this is more than just an offhanded in insult. Paul talks about these evil workers as people who mutilate the flesh, and, and Paul's going to go on to mention some things about circumcision as we continue on in this text. I believe Paul is talking here about Jewish teachers, probably ones who traveled around from city to city, who were entering Christian communities and uh, were probably trying to force new converts because, again, Christianity at the time, it was more or less seemed like a sect of Judaism. Uh, they, were, they were coming in and trying to get these new converts to adhere to the ritual uh, ceremonial aspects of Judaism. For example, circumcision being one of the most central, but also as well, uh, trying to get these new converts to adhere to all the Jewish customs that had to do with being clean or unclean. This concern with being ritually ceremonial, ceremonially clean, it was a really big deal for these Jewish teachers, no doubt, and yet Paul calls them dogs. Um, whenever I think about dogs, I, I think <laughs> one of the things I actually miss most about our life back in the U.S., uh, obviously I miss many, many things a great deal, uh, you know, our family, our, you guys, for example, but um, but one of those things that kind of sticks out in my head that I, that I miss is, is our dog, Carly. Uh, Lily and I had a, a really good dog. Some of you may have met her, actually. She came to a trunk or treat one year or maybe two years. Um, she was a great dog. We really liked having her. Um, she was well-trained. She behaved great. She loved us. It was cool coming home and, and, you know, she'd jump all over you and make you feel loved. But it was really hard not to bring her here. And we actually, we thought we were going to be able to do it, that it wouldn't be so expensive. And we, we looked into it and it was going to be something crazy. And there were risks associated with, with flying her over here. And so um, she's a great dog, but it was genuinely really sad when we didn't get to bring her. Um, since we've been here, we've even actually talked about maybe getting a dog here. And, uh, but, you know, we, it's one of those things that, you know, we don't know how long we're going to be here. It could be a short time. It could be a longer time. And uh, since we really don't know, it would be sad to be in a position where we'd have to leave another dog here. Um, and so, uh, you know, as Lily and I were dog people, and so that's one of those weirdly hard things about being here for us. Um, but, you know, we're modern Westerners. We, we like dogs. People around here, they're also modern Westerners, and they like their dogs. And and you guys, I'm sure there are many dog people among you. Um, but we're modern Westerners, and, and we like our dogs, their man's best friend, right? I mean, if somebody called me a dog, I, I know they're not meaning that nicely, but at the same time, I, I might be offended in the situation. I might be insulted, but it wouldn't be by the word dog. It'd be more by just the fact that 
they feel the need to insult me. I'd, I'd be more concerned about the context. I'd be more concerned about whatever it is that prompted that. But unlike us modern Westerners, Judeans did not see dogs as man's best friend. To Judeans, dogs were normally viewed more like we think about rodents and pests. They were scavengers. They were dirty. They were undesirable. Certain Jewish teachers even considered dogs to be themselves ritually unclean. That means that they thought that if you even so much as came into contact with a dog, then that made you unclean before God. So when Paul is calling these teachers, these teachers who are so concerned with ritual cleanliness, ceremonially, uh, ceremonial, ceremonial cleanliness, with following every last cleanliness regulation, when he's calling these teachers dogs, it's more than just an off-the-cuff insult. Paul is saying that these people are actually unclean. He's saying, I, I think, that their efforts to earn a place before God, they're useless. And their efforts to get others to do the same actually is more than useless. It's actually harmful. Paul continues in verse 3, here in Philippians 3. He says, for it is we who are the circumcision. He's saying it's, it's not those teachers who might actually physically be circumcised, but, but it is we whose hearts are circumcised, who, who have been justified by God before we did anything else. He says in verse 3, for it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God, who boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul is saying he has done it all. He's saying his resume looks a heck of a lot better than even those Jewish teachers who are trying to get you to be circumcised and to live under the old law and under all the other Jewish regulations of the day. Paul is saying, I'm more qualified than they are. If you're talking about being a good Jew, then I come first. If anyone could actually deserve to enter the presence of God, I'm at least closer to hitting the mark than they are. But Paul continues in verse 7. Paul says, yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, righteousness from God based on faith. Paul is saying, I lost everything. Now, Paul was uh, quite literally probably writing these words from a prison cell. Uh, and I think that probably has something to do with what he means when he's saying I've lost everything. But I don't think that's actually the heart of what he's talking about here. I think Paul is saying he has lost his core identity. He has lost what it means to be Paul, or what it meant to be Paul. He's saying he's lost the ability that he once thought he had to be good enough for God, to earn his place, his standing before God. Because if you actually think that you are good enough for God, if you are good enough to stand in the presence of God and say, here I am, then that's something you're going to be pretty proud of. It's something your whole identity is going to be wrapped up in. Paul is saying he, he's lost the credentials that he once held so dearly. He's saying that even though he, he's done some pretty impressive stuff and he comes from a pretty impressive family, he's saying it's actually all meaningless. As for Paul, all, all these things that he did in his past and, and all these roots that he has, they're meaningless. 
First, because they never actually made him good enough for God in the first place. Nobody actually can do that. So he seems to have thought that he had something that he never really had in the first place. Second of all, all these credentials and, and personal holiness before God that Paul thought he had achieved, they may have actually just been serving to make him full of himself. They weren't drawing him nearer to God. Because investing so much in those things for the purpose of earning God's love, it only sh serves to show that he didn't really know who God was. It proves that at some earlier point in Paul's life, he fundamentally misunderstood the nature, the person, the character of our God. who is a God of grace, of mercy, of love, of justice, yes, but he's a God who justifies his people by faith rather than making them do the impossible by justifying themselves. When Paul talks about Jesus here, I believe that he is saying that you, you don't get Jesus by doing all the right stuff. In fact, doing all the right stuff in order to get Jesus may only be taking you further away from him. Paul is saying that following Jesus means to lose yourself to Jesus. It means simply humbling yourself, putting your whole faith, your whole trust in Jesus, regardless of what kind of person you've been and what kind of person you may feel that you are at the moment. Faith in Jesus means that we don't get to boast about ourselves. It means we can't be prideful. It means we can't be snooty. We can't look down on those who we think just don't get their faith. They don't get God the way that we do. Because we all get God the same way. And it has virtually nothing to do with us, aside from our hearts. And that's humbling. If, if my whole faith, if my whole identity is wrapped up in proving that I'm a super Christian, and that my walk with Jesus is better than your walk with Jesus, is better than the guy next door's walk with Jesus, if, I, if I'm out to prove that you know all those other Christians, they're wrong about something, they're wrong about that piece of theology that I hold so dearly, and, and I'm going to prove it to them by talking down at them rather than engaging them with love and seeking to improve them, but also myself in the process. If I'm so wrapped up in, in proving people wrong and making my, my, uh, myself feel like I'm better than everyone else, then I may actually be damaging my walk with Christ. And, and that is a humbling realization. We don't get to be better than each other. We don't and we can't earn God. God extends himself to us, not the other way around. And it's humbling for some of us, but it's also great news. Paul continues in verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. We, we don't earn God. Our works don't do squat to get us closer to God. We can spend our whole lives trying to earn the love of God, and it will be meaningless. But if we, like Paul, genuinely put our full hope and our whole faith and our whole life in Christ, being washed in his blood and realizing that we've been cleansed thanks to him alone, if we do that, then we will also, like Paul, we will want to know Christ more and more. We will want to be like Christ more and more. We'll begin to share in his sufferings, not because they earn us God's love, but because we already have God's love. And that love compels us to lead a life that is characterized and driven by the love of God. What Christ has done for us, it's going to compel us to become like Christ. Our works, the way that we live our lives, will never do anything to earn us a standing before God. But a standing before God, which God has given us, it will change us. When we look to the author of our salvation and our faith and our very lives, then our lives begin to be transformed. And that transformation, it's going to be ongoing throughout our lives. It doesn't happen overnight. But when we invite God in, then God gives, God lives rather in us. He acts through us. 
And we'll find more and more that our hands and feet will begin to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world today. Serving, loving, sacrificing for our friends, for our neighbors, for our co-workers, for the whole world, even for our enemies. So College Hill family, let's be filled with Christ this evening. Let's set our eyes on him. Let's set our hopes and our hearts on Jesus. Let's be filled with the love and the hope and the grace that we have through Christ. And let's let that continue to change us, to shape us, to move us towards Christ in the service of God and of others. Let's put ourselves aside and let's join in the life and the work and the suffering of Christ as we go about our, our evening and our week this week. Let's take a moment to pray together. Father God, you are holy, you are good, you are high. There is nothing that we could do to earn you. There's nothing that we could do to deserve you. And yet we have you. Lord, help us to remember our place, that we're people who don't deserve you. But Lord, help us to remember that you love us, that you have given us life, that you've given us hope, Lord, and let us live out of that hope. Even in, in times that are strange and, and crazy world pandemic where life is just different, Lord, help us to live out of our hope. Lord, as we interact with, or not even physically interact with, but if we find whatever way we can to interact with the people in our lives, Lord, help us to live out of that hope, to share that message of hope that comes from you, Lord. Help us to be people who have you living in us, that have you living through us, or make our hands and feet the hands and feet of Christ. Lord, help us to be your church, to be built on your church, to grow your church, and to share the love that comes through your church, Lord. Lord, thank you for the College Hill family. Thank you for... Um, Everyone back in DFW who uh, you know, Lily and I feel so loved by and so supported by, we thank you for uh, just the, the love that we have that uh, doesn't share, it does, doesn't, um, it's not confined by borders, it's not confined by distance, it's not confined by time zones, Lord. We are grateful that we have the ability to stay in touch, and we thank you for that. Um, thank you for just all the people who, who may be watching this, and, and I, well, it's uh, unfortunately, I can't be there, be there live, Lord. I, I hope that you will use the words that have, that have been here to um, lift others up and to share your message and your love, Lord, uh, in your life. We thank you for the life that we have through you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.